Hi everyone and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players. I'm thrilled as always to be here with you. Paul is off on his well-deserved European jaunt. I hope you're enjoying yourself, Paul. Um, I'm super excited to uh, introduce to you today an amazing guest and I've been hoping to interview Rachel for a long time. Rachel Flowers is an amazing pianist. She's only really kicking off in her career. She's she's not even 30 yet and has already achieved some major, major life goals in music. As you'll hear in part one of this interview, we cover off um, Rachel's upbringing, uh, her passion for music, how she approaches creativity with her solo work and a whole lot more. Um, I think you'll enjoy this first part a great deal and I'll see you back for part two. Rachel, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time, particularly on a Friday afternoon. Have you had a busy week? Um, not really. I've just been relaxing for a while, playing keyboards, and guitar and bass and stuff like that. Yes, and we're certainly going to talk plenty about that. So I thought, Rachel, quite often with guests when we start off, we ask them about their early years in music. Now, because of uh, the excellent documentary you were part of, your early years in music are very well documented. So, you know, we know that you were playing Bark at Four, which is just amazing. Um, But I'm just interested, more so what your early memories um, sort of after Four, what... When did you realize, you know, I really actually love music? What, do you have any particular memories of that? I don't really remember fully. I think when I was about, my mom told me that when I was two and a half, I was sitting at my mom's upright piano and pounding on the keys with toys, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. Um, she, she um, helped me gently go through the piano and, Teach me Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and then I just figured out the rest. Yeah. And so do you remember how old you were? Like, yeah. I know I can't remember when I was four, Rachel. Did, when you were sort of six, eight, ten, was there a time when you actually thought uh, to yourself, I actually really, really like music? Mm-hmm. I think I just had that naturally once I started playing piano and then taking classical piano lessons when I was four with the... Grant Horrocks Conservatory that that's now closed, but um, David Pinto taught me how to uh, record music using the uh, computer when I was about five years old. Oh wow! And he helped write, yeah, he helped write uh, scripts for my computer so that way I would be able to navigate without using a mouse. So the having a speech voice tell me, you know, record or rewind or play or track or stuff like that. That's amazing. So uh, you, you've sort of preempted a question I was going to ask you anyway, which is how do you use technology to yeah. enhance your creativity? So, I mean, right now, what applications do you use, Rachel, if you are going to record some music? Um. I'm using the same program that I used when I was five years old. Uh, it's really old. It's a Cakewalk Sonar. Oh yeah. Yeah, on a, the uh, Windows computer. But I'm I'm hoping later on this year um, I'm going to learn how to use Logic Pro right. and um, yeah, Reaper. I think on um, the Mac computer. With the, the built-in voiceover, it's it's interesting because I what I would like to do is create music that's going to have a more modern production. Because uh, how do I describe it? Lately, I've been well for a while. I would compose and record music that has a very classic sound, like yeah, nineteen seventies or nineties, like jazz meets rock. Yeah. Yeah. But I would like to come up with something that's more uh, current sounding, like um, the jazz artist Jacob Collier. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, is that someone I, I you have you haven't had the chance to collaborate with him? No, not yet. I'm glad you but said yet. Yeah, I think that'll happen. 
Yeah. I covered one of his songs that I had my mom put up on SoundCloud for me. The uh, With the Love in My Heart from Jesse Volume 1. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so, and so the, that modern sort of feel you'd like to create music and things like, as you said, Reaper and Logic Pro will help you do that. So, I mean, that probably leads to a good question. How do you come up with concepts for for songs? What is your actual composition process? You know, do you get an idea? Do you sit behind the piano? How does that actually work for you when you're creating your own work? Mm, it's It's different every time. Sometimes I actually have dreams where I'm asleep and I'm hearing this pretty wild piece of music and then when I wake up from the dream I instantly record myself reciting the dream and the dialogue and the music Great. and then once I'm fully awake I'm able to uh, start recording all the instruments using my uh, Nord keyboard uh, Sometimes the uh, I have a Studio Logic keyboard, which is oh, yeah. really you know, it's really nice. I, I love it. And then my guitars and five string bass or ukulele bass to make it sound like an upright. And then the drum parts are played on the keyboard in real time. So the left hand's playing the kick and the snare. The right hand's doing the uh, hi hat and the cymbals. No programming, no quantization. It's just all played live. And then um, vocals. Once I normally I would get my my Mac laptop and start writing. If if I'm hearing lyrics, I normally would write them. I'd write them down on my laptop, and then make a voice memo of myself singing it. Uh, and then if I feel like recording the vocal, I can just record the vocal with my microphones at on the computer and stuff like that and then produce it and mix it and put reverb and all the production stuff. So, Yeah, that's amazing. So for those of us that aren't <laughs> quite as um, proficient with instruments as yourself, so it sounds like if you using the dream as an example, you'll have a dream, You, I assume you have some sort of voice recorder or your, your phone or whatever it is by, by your bedside. So you'll <laughs> sing the lines to yourself yeah. just to capture them at the time um, and then recreate them the yeah. next day or whenever you have a chance. Mm -hmm. And so how often would that happen, Rachel? Is that something that's a, a daily, weekly, monthly mm -hmm. occurrence for you? I don't know. It kind of, it, it comes and goes. <laughs> yeah. That's... Yeah. And so how many of those pieces have ended up forming the basis of, of your, your solo um, albums that you've released? Oh, there's a bunch. Uh, so on the first album, Listen, which is sort of a jazz classical that one I didn't do the uh, mixing. I sent all my tracks, piano, bass, and guitars, and orchestration using the using sample libraries from East West and oh, yeah. Vienna Symphonic Library, yeah, which are not accessible, unfortunately. So I had my friend help me uh, help me with those sounds. I would ask him, do you, my friend Brian Hudgeson from Seattle. He's the one that got me set up with all my uh, studio equipment at around like 2013, 2014, when I started doing the Frank Zappa covers that mom put up on SoundCloud. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when I was working on Listen, I remember some of the song, like uh, the songs that came from Dreams, there is the beginning of Greg's favorite um, most of Don Points, which is this very symphonic, mm -hmm. classical uh, kind of a thing. Um, what else? On uh, Going Somewhere, the song Time, that was pretty much that whole song came in a very vivid dream. And then Love Today from Big on the Inside, that entire song came from the dream. Except for most of the lyrics, I had to rephrase some of the lyrics once I woke up. But yeah, that was a pretty cool. That is that is extremely cool, and th this might be getting a little bit too deep, Rachel. But what do you think leads to 
music been so clear for you in dreams? Do you think it's, uh, you know, is it a higher power? Is it just all of our brains working over time when we sleep? What do you think, you know, drives that for you? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the answer most of us would say. <laughs> I remember when I was eight years old, I had this dream where I heard this song because I've been listening to a lot of TV themes. This was like yep. 1990s, so uh, stuff like Law and Order, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, yeah. the difference between season one and then the later seasons, how the song was, how the music was restructured and, and played by different ensembles. Like, you know, and then I had this dream where I heard this rocking theme song and there were these trumpets and and guitars and my dad plays electric guitar and in the dream I heard my dad play some lead guitar in the song. That's amazing. <laughs> and I still remember how it went too. <laughs> and is composition along those lines, Rachel, something you're interested in? So whether it's um, or well, music across, you know, obviously film, TV, audio books, um, plays. Is that something that you, you've got an interest in exploring in future? I would love to do film score stuff. Actually, I, I worked on a music for a, a film that my uh, film director, Lorenzo Di Stefano, he's the one that directed and, and made the uh, my documentary, Hearing is Believing. Yeah. And he he wrote this kind of a short story about an experience that he uh, that, that he witnessed called a Stairway to the Stars. And he had me record four things. Two of them were Eric Satie compositions. So that those were pretty easy. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then the other two were like Lorenzo said, you know, here's a song by, Philip Glass, but this is this is kind of the idea that I'm hearing, and I was like, okay, got it. And then, and then the next one was very like um, melancholy, like it was. It's mainly music for the background because it's a, uh, it's all dialogue based. So the whole yeah. the whole the whole story is about these two people, and uh, they are climbing these stairs during those sequences when they're climbing the stairs and it kind of start, stop, start, stop. Um, coming up with the music was pretty cool. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Cause it is, it is a very different process, isn't it? And so that's something you'd like to explore in future. If the opportunity came up more film or TV. Yeah. 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 And mm -hmm. I, I suppose, I, I suppose some of the advantage of film and TV scoring is it can be done at a little bit more of a, well, it can be actually very fast paced, but at least you're not, you don't have the live pressure there. It's, it's more, you know, you can work through the themes and I, I can see the appeal. I ser it certainly appeals mm -hmm. to me. Some of my favorite composers and favorite musicians, I've been uh, checking out a lot of their music. Like I've been a huge fan of uh, just the diverse range, not just jazz and classical, but also rock and even like really heavy industrial stuff like Nine Inch Nails and yeah. I was like really getting into the sound design of Trent Reznor and then when I found out that Trent Reznor worked on film scores and I was just like oh wow that's that's cool so I would listen to a movie like The Social Network or the Pixar movie about the uh, jazz pianist who's auditioning and he oh yeah uh, soul and that spacey music. It's so like you have John Batiste. He does the jazz music during the New York s sequences. He actually he does all the music that's played by the character Jamie Foxx's character. Uh, but then the spacey, dreamy, synthesized type uh, music during the Great Beyond uh, sequence. That's Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. I was like, wow, that's so that's cool. That's different, yeah, <laughs> very diverse. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I'm, a major <laughs> Atticus, I'm a major Atticus Ross fan, I, I've got to say, mm -hmm. Rachel, and Trent too. So, no, I think that's, that's cool. it's, it's a great perspective. Mm -hmm. And the other question about creativity I've been wanting to ask you, and this comes from your documentary very early on, mm -hmm. and that's 
for you the link between ah. food and music that you're you're very like you have this brilliant yeah. ability to associate yeah. particular foods and types of music can you explain over the years how that's developed for you and what what you think's behind that like for our yeah. listeners explain what that does mean to you i'm really fascinated yeah I've, i don't really remember i guess when i was very little i hadn't really developed my verbal skills yet and um I was I could only echo what people would say like my mom or something like that. But when I would listen to certain music or sounds if if I was eating food that I really liked I would immediately hear music like harmonies and chords like if I was eating uh vanilla yogurt if it was delicious vanilla yogurt I would often hear like a a really smooth version of a D minor chord like na, 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 yeah. something like that is very That's interesting amazing. yeah yeah that is amazing and so has that ever been the fuel for any of your other compositions as far as have you used that as a as a kickoff point for any of your other songs yeah actually um the uh, aloha suite from my uh, listen album that actually originated from uh, I was at this restaurant I think it's closed now, but it was called, was it the Aloha Steakhouse in Ventura? Okay. Yeah. And they had this, they had this really delicious steak and uh, there were these crackers. They were kind of like, they were not exactly Ritz crackers or saltines, but they were kind of a mixture of both. And uh, I started out by drinking really good water, cold water with a straw and right out of the out of the blue, my brain started hearing the opening string part to the Aloha Suite. Wow! Yeah, and then when I when I was eating the food, like the steak and the I think it was mashed potatoes, no, maybe it was French fries. I can't remember now, but it, it was it. I just immediately heard the rest of the song. <laughs> that's that's absolutely and I made amazing. Notes. So, did you? Have, I was about to say, <laughs> did you have to stop dinner to make notes? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I was, I was. I was making some notes on my machine. My, uh, I, I have a machine called a Victor Reader Stream, which is, uh, it's a device that, that's often used from the blind and low vision communities where, uh, most people use it to listen to books. I like to use it for, uh, listening to all kinds of music. Like I have, uh, 16 gig SD cards and I've, I have oh, a gigantic wow. collection. <laughs> yeah, so I could listen to music right now. I have it on a an SD card that's mainly jazz singers like uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, Billie Holiday, uh, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, uh, Annie Ross, um, Esperanza Spalding, Gretchen Parlato. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Etc. Etc. And, and I know with your your creative output to date, Rachel, you, you're extremely um, proficient at mixing genres. So, what is it that you love? I've seen some great pieces that you've mixed. You know, whether it's classical and rock or funk or soul or jazz. What what, what um, passion? Like, what's the love of that mm. that you like so much as far as mixing genres? Like combining them together. Yeah. 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 Um, I think for with classical, it's. I think I discovered this when I was taking when I start. Uh, when I was doing classical piano, I was learning about Johann Sebastian Bach and Beethoven through their compositions, and I really liked the Beethoven piano sonatas because it had these structures and melodies and different hooks and it would surprise you. And then when I started learning how to play the flute, because I've always wanted to play the flute, I would listen to a lot of flute music when I was little. But my hands, at the time, my hands were too small. They weren't big enough. And once yeah. I was finally able to um, play a, a silver flute when I was 10, um, I would be taking a lot of classical flute lessons and I would study uh, music in Braille, so I would read the Braille music notation 
more than learning the music by ear, just because so many musicians they pl- the music is it's the same charts, the same score, but one person probably will play it in a melancholy way, and then another person would probably interpret it in a very flashy, fast way. So I was very restricted on, you know, this is the written score and um, this is how I would like you to play it kind of a thing. So I was like, okay. But I think the thing I've learned from the classical stuff, especially the works of uh, Mozart, his Mm -hmm. his flute concerto in G major, that uh, that piece taught me a lot about structure, and I remember thinking because this was right around the time I started listening to pop radio, so okay. I was listening to uh, stuff like um, Taylor Swift, John Mayer, and I started to in my head I was like, wait a second, they're writing songs in in a structure very similar to what Mozart was doing harmonically. It was like, this is pretty cool. So, you know, the theme might start at this place and then you take a break for a while, you you bring back that melody in a different key and then you gradually, at the end of the song, you you take it back to where it began. I was like, that's just like a pop song that my, like the songs my mom writes because my mom, she's she's a songwriter and a guitar player. Yeah, so I grew up listening to her music when I was very little. I mean, it wasn't professionally recorded at the time, but I was once I was ready to record my mom's music, and we worked on it together. It was just so exciting. Um, but you know, I was thinking about combining genres with classical. It's the structure of uh, how to structure a song, and then with jazz. What I love about jazz is Anybody could play the same song, and they could just do whatever they want. Whereas in classical, you got you got the score. That's the only way that you play it. Um, but with jazz, you know, someone could play uh, a song like "My Funny Valentine." One singer could do it as a as a ballad, and then another person would probably play it as a symphonic opus. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So that was the cool thing about jazz. You just get to do whatever you want with that song. And and, um, and especially now, diving into the 1950s recordings or even 60s or 70s from Ella Fitzgerald and you know, other singers like Betty Carter, the difference between how they deliver a song, the vibrato control and uh, enunciation of the words. And then with rock, I just love how the guitars are used. I think one of the first things that I listened to once I started wanting to teach myself how to play guitar, this was around like 2011, 2012. Um, but I, um, my mom had a, a nylon string guitar and it, it didn't have, oh, what's the word? Like the way it was designed, I couldn't go past the 12th fret on the guitar, so I was a little bit like a little limited, yeah. and I yeah. And um, right around the time Brian stepped in, uh, and my dad actually he he went to a SWAT meet one day, and um, he found this Ibanez guitar. And my dad he's he's pretty cool. He introduced me to guitar virtuosos when I was little. So even if my even if I couldn't really uh, imagine myself playing guitar, I actually tried to imitate it on the keyboard. But I was—I've always loved listening to uh, Joe Satriani, yeah. Steve Vai, yeah. <laughs> Eric Johnson. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, um, the the G3 1996 concert, which is Eric Johnson, Steve Vai, and Joe Satriani. Um, just hearing the three guitarists together or separately and the the sound and the difference between the way Joe Satriani solos and then the way Steve Vai solos and the way Eric Johnson solos. And um, once I started teaching myself the guitar, I was like, what would be some good guitar music to uh, 
to study, and a, and a lot of it was just by um, research, and this is when I started researching on my computer, and it's also the time I started using my iPhone right around like 2012. Uh, met my grandpa, um, it was like two years before he passed away, he was in his 90s um, from my mom's family, and uh, he had this gigantic Epiphone guitar. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I used to go to their ha you know, my grandma and grandpa's house, and um, they let me play on uh, on that guitar, and I just started listening to the Who's Quadrophenia album that <laughs> my my uncle Lonnie played me that album when I was like probably ten or something like that. I can't remember this that the same time I was listening to Miles Davis, so I was I was like. This is cool, and at the time, my brain hadn't processed the whole music, but actually the parts that caught my attention when I was first hearing Quadrophenia was how they sampled the ocean. The way that Pete Townsend was able to really capture the uh, the natural characteristics of the ocean yeah. where he where he lived, and it was so cool because we live very close to the ocean uh, in Oxnard and um, but right around 2012 when I started teaching myself guitar I would listen to Quadrophenia I'm going hey these songs are in keys that I could actually learn on the guitar it's like <laughs> so I would just learn to play all these Pete Townsend songs even the guitar solos and then later on it became uh, what else I, I don't really remember. I think I was just fascinated by guitar players um, when I was learning about Steve Vai, and then I, that's when I started checking out Frank Zappa. Yes. Yeah, and uh, well, way... uh, yeah let, let's talk about that for a minute, if you don't mind, Rachel. So, Zappa, tell us the yeah. impact he, he had on you when you first heard his work. Yeah, it's pretty wild because he was born... He he's born. He was born on my same birth date, uh, twelve twenty one, wow. and he actually and he passed away the year I was born, nineteen ninety three. So it was it was pretty bizarre, you know. And I, when I researched that, I was like, "Well, wait a second, December twenty first? <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's <laughs> destiny there, Rachel. There's destiny. Yeah, it's wild. And what was pretty wild about his music is he was one of those artists who combine many styles like some of his uh i my favorite work of his is um uh, the band from the 1970s with the jazz keyboard player the late george duke oh yeah yeah so that's like um that time period where you had the jazz sound you had the rock you sound you had the uh the satire you had the the stravinsky quotes and the classical quotations, and then you get to the 80s recordings, and he would orchestrate so many of his songs, like he would rework his songs, and he would, especially the, because so much of his stuff was recorded live. Mm. I was listening a little bit to, um, I can't remember if it was the best band you've never heard in your life, I think is what it was, <laughs> but he has... <laughs> He has the saxophone ensemble, and when they're doing um, the torture never stops, and there's a like that song is kind of a really heavy song, but the way that Frank reworks several of the sections, and he's like mid like in the middle of the song, he's quoting mission impossible and then the bonanza theme and then some like a dylan <laughs> <laughs> thing and and then he'll go back to the torture never stops and and it's crazy <laughs> i have the i have this feeling you and him would have gotten on really well Ra rachel in yeah. that respect of genres if uh, obviously uh, he uh, sadly passed away a lot of years ago now but if you'd had the opportunity to ask him a question or two what would you have asked him how do you write all those crazy uh, notes that 
or like very odd, oddly times, like the eleventh and the thirteenth, yeah. like the black page, like, like, like. How did you come up with those insane <laughs> marimba parts for Ruth Underwood to play? Yes. Yeah. No, great. Like you know, Saint Alfonso's pancake breakfast from the apostrophe album. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, mm-hmm. it's, there's so much to explore in there. And so obviously in recent years, you've had the opportunity to play with Dweezil Zappa. Describe how, mm-hmm. that first, how that first came about. So what led to that happening and then what your experience was with that, how, how, how it was actually recreating some mm-hmm. of that amazing music. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the whole thing. I think I just, once Brian cooked me up with my studio equipment around like 20, 2013, it was right around the time my friend uh, Matt Livonian he built me a guitar because I I wanted to find an electric guitar that that was more my size. So okay. this friend of our this friend of ours Matt Livonian he built this uh, really nice electric guitar for specifically for me. And sadly, he's unable to build instruments anymore which is really sad but um he built me this guitar we call it a marble head (laughs) and uh it has these pickups in it the sound is just amazing um but i use it for a lot of my songs then and there's actually some other ibanez guitars that are much that are they're a lot smaller that brian helped me get first when we bought a guitar center and I was actually present there I was like wow this this guitar is small it's a, it's got 24 frets perfect I, I could play some fish repertoire okay awesome <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I asked Brian I said hey Brian do you, is there a way you could put like a is there some way I could do to sustain notes like Frank Zappa and Troy Anastasio so I could be like and he's like Oh yeah, you know there's this thing that Dweezil uses. So I'll 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 find something like that. And then he put it on there. I was and so that's how I'm able to get that. Anyway, I'm I'm moving ahead, but um when I was doing the, the first Frank Zappa cover, Inca Rhodes oh, yep. back in like twenty fourth no it had to be twenty thirteen. Um this that song I used the guitar my dad got for me the Ibanez guitar it's like a, it's kind of a medium big it's not big but it's well it is kind of big but it's not as gigantic as my grandpa's guitar so yes. yeah and um we heard about the zappas and we're going to make sure that Dweezil hears the music and immediately Dweezil was like you know it that was pretty cool so when i got to meet Dweezil in 2015 at the uh, NAM booth, which is captured in the film. Yes. I was so happy. I was like, I had no idea they were filming it. And I'm really happy for that now because it was just so cool. But yeah, you know, I could, and he's like, I think, was it Brian told me? I can't remember. He's like, oh, um, Dweezil Zappa, he's, uh, he's, in the, uh, he's in this booth. Do you want to meet him? I was like, yeah, I'd love to meet him. <laughs> And and this guy's like, please welcome Mr. Tweezel Zappa. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, Rachel, I got to meet you. I got to meet you. Um, yeah, they're, they're doing a movie about her. Uh, wait, let me shake your hand. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, you know, we're doing a show. We're, we're going to perform the entire One Size Fits All album because that's the one that has... Um, Inca Rose, which was the first Zappa song that I covered, and um, he's like, "Yeah, we're you know we're we're gonna do that song. So if you would like to play on it, that would be great." I was like, "Oh yeah, I'd love to do that." And then he says, "Cause he he um, he heard me, you know, playing all the instruments, and he was like, you know, I would I would really love to do uh, uh, a a song like Montana, so that you and I can just." trade yeah. guitars i was like that would be cool so <laughs> we got to do that at the vegas show and um 
And the entire version of Montana, it's on the Hearing is Believing soundtrack. So I'm really happy for that. Yeah. And, 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 and at that show, I played on the Marblehead guitar that uh, Matt built for me. We'll be linking to that in our show notes, Rachel. And I'm not sure that it's that cool. show, but we, we had the... We had the pleasure of having um, Chris Norton on the show, who played keyboards with with Dweezil around that mm. that period. And he, uh, when we interviewed Chris, he yeah. gave us a great anecdote of you playing his rig and just you know, Inca Roads for non Zappa <laughs> fans is one of those songs. It's not super easy to play. I think it's fair to say, Rachel, isn't it? It's there's there's a lot in it. Yep. Um, and Chris mm-hmm. was blown away um, that. Um, let alone, you, you know, you, you're being blind. But he said even a, full, a, a, a person with full sight would have struggled to grasp the rig to cover off Inca roads in the time that you had. But you you nailed it. You nailed it within a mm-hmm. you know a few minutes of, of being familiarised with the rig. So do you have recollections of playing yeah. Inca roads with Tweezel that night? Mm-hmm. That was pretty cool. Yeah, um, it was pretty wild because when I covered that song at home. I had listened to um, a lot of different renditions, but I mainly focused on the version on the One Size Fits All record with George Duke and Chester Thompson on drums and Napoleon Murphy Brock on saxophone and Ruth Underwood on percussion. But I also checked out other renditions from sort of the Shut Up and Player guitar. Oh, yeah. Uh, where he's got Vinnie Caliuta on drums and they're just like, they're like, battling each other rhythmically (laughs) and so I wanted to combine the energy of those and so having memorized those crazy sections and you know being able to play the George you know basically channel George Duke uh, Mm. at at that show during that crazy that because the song it's for those that might not know it's um It's kind of like progressive rock meets jazz fusion, but on its head. Like it's it's not as thematically structured. Like um, um, how do I say it? It's it's um, the melody. Like Frank was all about going to unusual places musically, Mm. and the melody the melodies that he wrote. Like like the songs that Frank would sing, for the most part, the melodies were very simple because he was addressing social uh, stuff, especially in his latter years. But um, if you're talking about a song like Inca Roads with George Duke, that was the beginning of George, uh, his vocals, because I guess George Duke initially wasn't really considering himself as a singer. He was an mm. incredible he was an incredible virtuoso on the keyboard with the Rhodes piano and, and all that. Um, but this song allowed George Duke to really dive into his singing ability as well as the synthesizer. And then ever since then, he's he became such an uh, expert on the synthesizer. And throughout the rest of his life, he did a lot of gospel, jazz, groovy type stuff like if george clinton met up with um jimi hendrix yes that (laughs) yes but yeah inca roads it's that's really crazy there's a it starts off with a very um spacey kind of a fusiony jazz fusiony like if if chick korea met up with um uh, like something that just takes you to a completely different universe musically. And then there's a section that's a guitar solo. And then after the guitar solo, there's, um, uh, it's, there's this very proggy middle, mm. middle section that switches time signatures and changes keys. And it, there's this, and then the the keyboard solo happens, and during the keyboard solo, it's this insane fast. Um, what is it? One, two, three, four. Is this a really insanely fast seven eight groove? And wow. now, normally when 
Dweezil's band did it, they kind of played it more light in the in the okay. rhythmic ensemble. Like, but when Frank did it, so when we started doing that part of the song, at, at we we had a sound check before the show, and um, and and they were like, "Do you think we could do it that insanely fast?" I was like, "Yeah, I would love to do it, like the you know the George Duke thing on yeah. the record." So and they did it, and it was just really cool. <laughs> that is very cool. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. just amazing. And I mean, <laughs> and just because you know we we don't um, have unlimited time, and I wish we did. So uh, you you sort of move from from sort of uh, playing stuff like Zappa, then you move to something super super easy and simple like Emerson Lake and Palmer. So that's obviously a joke, but yeah. it's um, so tell us about <laughs> that that um, sort of yeah. how you got into their music as well, which obviously all of us listening to this and watching yeah. this are, are keyboard players and ELP are obviously, <laughs> you know, iconic, uh, mm -hmm. iconic acts. So what, what ignited yeah. your passion for that? Mm. Yeah. So when I was nine years old, I had been doing a lot of classical piano stuff and listening to a lot of classical music since I was very little like um the works of people like Aaron Copland and uh Bach, Beethoven, mm. Mozart. This one time mom and I mom the the whole well mom, dad and Vaughn and I, we went to a, a friend's house. His name is McCrae and we've known him since I was very very little. And he's a keyboard player and a songwriter and um He's yeah. He's actually came to some of my recent shows, right. which is pretty cool. But uh, yeah, when I was nine, he uh, we're we're at his house. I'm sitting at this piano, and I'm playing some Bach music by ear, and um, I think some Debussy. And I take a break, and McCray puts on the Endless Enigma including the fugue section and I and I had a cassette I had a cassette tape recorder like the the was it like a Sony or oh, yep. is those really those yeah before the iPhone so no iPhones yet um so yeah the sound quality was not that great on on those tape recorders but um knew that things were going to improve in the future I don't know how yeah. I just I just knew uh, but even though I couldn't figure it out, I was like, one day it's going to be better. Um, so I'm listening to the Ellis Enigma, and, and it gets to the fugue section. And at first I'm thinking it's a guitar, because it's Greg mm -hmm. Lake on the bass and Keith Emerson on the, on the grand piano. It's one of the rare times he plays grand piano with ELP. Um because for the most part, it was the synthesizer and the Hammond organ. That's right. Yeah. But there were very few times where the piano was featured. And uh, I would say that Take a Pebble and The Endless Enigma really demonstrate the piano. But uh, it it gets to the end of the fugue, and then the tubular bells come in dun, dun, mm. dun, dun, with Carl Palmer. And I was just like, wow, this. And I couldn't really verbalize it yet. My speaking skills weren't still fully developed but in yeah. my head i'm thinking wow this is like this is and then the synthesizer doing a kind of a french horn-esque i was like wow, it's like a french horn but it, it's not a french horn but it's 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 like a french horn and then yeah. the hammer they were gonna like wow what is that <laughs> and then he puts on the title track trilogy Oh, and yeah. the song starts, and there's yeah, and the, there's this piano, and then once the Moog synthesizer kicks in, um, when the full band comes in, this is the moment where I was just like, wait, a synthesizer could do that? Because i've yeah. I've been listening to <laughs> I've been listening to a lot of synthesizer music, like. Um, craft work so very um you know um textured composition yeah 
Yeah. And I was also listening to dance music on the radio. So I was used to hearing synthesizers as like catchy hooks for people to dance. And then I'm hearing this synthesizer that's almost like a, a cross between a trumpet or a violin or whatever, like a saxophone. And I was like, hey, this is sort of like some of the jazz stuff that I started listening to. And it caught my attention. I was just like, mm. this is like, this is cool. And then when I was 10, I remember I was, I had a cassette tape where I recorded Trilogy from that particular visit. And I was disappointed that I accidentally erased the tape. <laughs> I was like, no, what, what, what happened there? And without knowing it, my mom bought me uh, a best of, and this was before we were able to get the uh, actual albums. Yeah. Yeah. But my mom bought me the best of Emerson, Lake and Palmer CD. And I'm going through the tracks on my CD player with my boom box. I was using the boom box to uh, record the radio and CDs. And, and it actually had a built in microphone so I could record myself speaking. Cool. And, yeah. And um, I'm going through the end of every song, and one of those tracks is the ending of Trilogy. I was like, oh, that's this is the song that I recorded on the cassette tape. <laughs> and, then I, and then I go through the rest of the tracks. I'm like, wait a second. That's Fanfare for the Common Man by Aaron Copeland. Yes. That's cool. <laughs> they, they added a beat to it. Now they're going to do kind of a, a bluesy almost a harmonica style bluesy jam here and and like wow this is crazy and that that and would have that, had to have been a big influence on your work wouldn't it have Rachel as, as oh, we've yeah. talked about you love mixing genres I, I can't imagine a better example of mixing mm -hmm. genres than ELP mm -hmm. yeah it was really cool <laughs> Like taking, adapting a piece of classical music and then giving it more of a jazzy, bluesy, soulful, uh, experimental twist on it was really neat. And uh, I remember that. And around that same time, my I've been a big fan of the um, the the beginning of also Sprague Zarathustra, which was famously. Uh, used in 2001. Oh, yep. <laughs> and uh, I've been listening to a lot of orchestral renditions of that piece. This was before I got to listen to the movie 2001. Oh, yep. Yeah, before descriptive audio. So my brain had no idea what was going on in the movie. <laughs> I just, I was like, hey, that's... um." There's that also Sprague Zarathustra intro, and my dad said, um, Hey, Rachel, I think you're going to really like Diodato's um, funky version. Like He, he, he had it, and it was like... <laughs> I was really happy. I was like, wow! They actually uh, they gave it a kind of a, a jazzy twist, and then yeah. we ended up getting that album for my ninth birthday, the prelude, the CD version of that album it's like Ron, it has to be Ron Carter on bass there's just that bass sound that and that that's like 70s it's you know you got Billy Cobham he's like one of my favorite drummers yeah. and Hubert Laws is one of my favorite flute players and um but that whole album he adapted excerpts of um WC Um, afternoon of the fawn or something like that. Yeah, yep. yeah, <laughs> so cool. So and then later on, you know, getting into Emerson Lake and Palmer, and then eventually getting the official albums. You know, pictures at an exhibition. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, of course, the first album, Knife Edge, which is adapted from Symphon uh, Symphonietta by Janacek, and and I ended up checking out that original piece. 
that whole piece is really cool. It's if you're not familiar with the original Sinfonietta by I think it's Leos Janacek. Okay. That's the piece that Knife Edge came from. That came from this really cool brass section in Sinfonietta. And uh, the that whole piece from top to bottom is just... It's really cool. There's all these melodies and themes. Um, it's just really cool. 